Well, as you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, I want to thank uh, our guest musician, Mark, for playing for us tonight. Thank you very much. And not only that, is his daughter Michaela did slides tonight, and she did amazing. So thank you for that, Michaela. So tonight we are in John chapter 13. And I have an alliteration for you. Don't get used to it, because I'm usually not very good at it. Uh, So we're going to look at the table, the towel, and the traitor tonight out of John chapter 13. And uh, I'm going to read a large portion of Scripture tonight, um, just because it's such a great scene, and I don't want to break it up too much ahead of time. So... Uh, Please follow along in your Bible. I'm going to read out of the NASB, and uh, then I'll pray for us. So John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper... The devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined to the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is no greater than his master, nor is the one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. That he was willing to serve. To serve to the point of death. To give us this amazing example that we see tonight of washing the disciples' feet. Lord, we pray that you would touch our hearts and our minds and that you would motivate us as Jesus has said that we would do these things that this wouldn't merely go into our heads and our hearts but it would flow out of our hands and our feet and our mouths that we would do things that would help us to wash one another's feet so please bless this night in Jesus name amen Well, well, let's return to verse 1 as we see these details that John gives us. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own and were in the world, he loved them to the end. So it's good to know that the Passover was at hand. Now, this is the Thursday night before Jesus' death. And John radically hits the brakes in his gospel. The first 12 chapters of the gospel of John, he is basically racing through 
Jesus' ministry life, the three years, most likely four years of Jesus' ministry life. Twelve chapters for that. John, he slams on the brakes, and for the next five chapters, we're going to be looking at this Thursday night and all that occurred. The other three synoptic, synoptic gospels do not share what John shares. John gets into the weeds, and I so appreciate that he does. He gives us details that are amazing. So we see that they're together to celebrate the Passover that'll happen the next day. Now the Galilean Jews, they would cel celebrate Passover on Thursday. So those were the, were the northern Jews. And then they would travel down to Judea, to the southern jurisdiction, where the Passover would actually happen on that Friday. But Jesus has his disciples together to have this meal. And Jesus tells us that his hour had come. Remember that we've already gone, we've moved into this hour. That now it's time for Jesus to go to the cross. And this was what his life was set up to accomplish, that death on the cross. He also said that he knew that he would depart from the Father. And I love that idea. He knew where he was from, and he knew where he was going. And for us, do we know where we are from and where we are going? I know I'm from my mom, and I'm from the miry clay, and now I'm going to heaven. I know that without a doubt, because it's not based on me. It's based on Jesus and what he has given me in his word, the promises that he's made to me that my destination is secure. And Jesus knew that same thing. He knew who he was, what he'd accomplish, what he would accomplish in the near future, and where he'd be going after. Look also at the end of that verse. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. First, you need to know, do you belong to him? Are you one of his own? I hope you are. I hope you remember that each and every day that he owns you. In a sense, you own him, that you have that relationship together, that he is your Lord and you are his servant. And he says that he loved them to the end. He loves them to the uttermost. He loves them to the vanishing point. It's never going to end. No matter what you do, no matter how you fall short, he will love you to the very end. Throughout this life, no matter the hardships that come, he has promised that he will love you through this life into the next. We won't get lost along the way. He doesn't lose his children. Well, let's look into verse 2. It says, And supper being ended the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, the New King James translation says supper being ended, but it's better to say that supper being in progress. You saw that in the NASB. It says that supper is going on. So maybe the main dishes have been served, but they're not into the fullness of the meal yet. So in the midst of the meal, something has gone awry. In this beautiful picture of this meal together with his disciples, Judas Iscariot is mentioned here, a blight on the whole scene, that he is there to betray Jesus. But he is in the midst of the fold, having this meal. But it's in Judas's heart to betray, supposedly, his Lord. In verse 3, we see that Jesus has great authority and great confidence. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Remember that Jesus has all authority. He had all authority as he sat at that table, as Judas was preparing to betray him. Jesus knew this would all have to play out. And that he would rise from the dead after a horrible suffering on the cross and a separation from his father. But all authority has been given to him. We remember that from John 3. It says that 
The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And then in the midst of all that goes on in our lives, he has all authority. Remember in the end of Matthew when he says, all authority has been given to me and I send you out. Go and make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, under the Lordship of Christ, have given authority to preach the gospel, the great commission to go do his work and his will. And we know at the very end, in 1 Corinthians, it tells us that the kingdom will come to an end and that Jesus will deliver the kingdom to God and that all rule and authority will be given over to the Father. And so authority continues on and is consistent. Even we see the chaos of the world around us. God knows, and he's working out a plan. So don't lose heart. Continue to serve him. Well, let's take a look at our next two verses, 13, chapter 13, 4 and 5. It says, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Something else has happened at this meal that's not appropriate. This is a meal that's held at a table called a triclinium. Now, Leonardo da Vinci did us a disservice because you're used to seeing these 12 apostles in Jesus on fold-up tables, all lined out in a long row. But the way that it happened was a low table shaped like a U. It was a Roman table called a triclinium. And it was a low table where you would lean on your left arm and you would eat with your right hand. I don't know if you've ever had Thanksgiving or a meal out where you eat so much that all you want to do is go home and lay on the floor. Well, they just kind of cut out the middleman here and they just laid on the floor right away. But the problem is you're stretched out around this table is that your feet are hanging out by the other guy's head. And there's a problem here because their feet were unclean. They did not take care of having their feet washed before they came to the meal. And we know the reason that they didn't do this is because this was a slave's job. The lowest slave of a house would be the one washing the feet. And as people walk through these dusty roads, these dirt roads in Jerusalem and through the middle, middle East, you would pick up a lot of dirt and a lot of dung on your feet. And the last thing you want to do is drag that into a home. I mean, we have that kind of culture today. You'll go to some homes and they'll ask you to take off your shoes before you come in the house. Now, sometimes for me, the solution is worse than the problem. Uh, cause I mean, it, it's just sweaty feet, you know, it's just the way it is, but, but I understand it and I honor it and I like to know ahead of time so I can bring some fresh socks or, you know, some shower to shower into my shoes before I come. But we see here that these disciples with dirty feet are at the dinner table and Jesus is the one who's going to step up to take care of the disciples' feet. Another reason we know this has happened is because in Luke, it tells us about the disciples' heart and where they were at. Do you remember this? Even in the midst of this meal, it tells us in Luke 20, 22, 24, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. This is why their feet were dirty because no one was willing to take that lower position. They always argued about who would be the best, who would be the greatest. Do you remember even in Matthew 20, the sons of Zebedee, John, and James, they got their mom involved with this whole argument. Hey, mom, will you go check with Jesus? Which of one of us will be the greatest? And she went and she asked Jesus. But Jesus said, the greatest is the servant of all. And that wasn't just lip service for Jesus. He did it. He took off his garment. He girded on a towel and took that water pot 
and went and washed the disciples' feet. Paul elaborated on this in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no rep reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus, being the creator of the universe, the creator of these very men, the creator of the dirt that was on their feet was willing to humble himself and wash their arrogant feet, their fighting hearts. He was willing to do that, and it didn't just end there. He was willing to go to the cross and to receive the shame of the cross. Well, back into John Verse 6, it says, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And I like Peter. He just can't help himself, but I think he's speaking for the whole group. He, he realizes who he is. He realizes that he's a dirt bag. You know, that Jesus shouldn't be washing his feet. So it seems that he is speaking for the whole group. He knows, I am a sinful man. You can't be washing my feet. You're not the lowest slave. You're the Lord of all. You're the greatest. But he does speak out. He understands what's going on here, what Jesus is doing for them. Peter gets a response from Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, What, am I, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. What I think is about funny, funny about this is maybe, John, maybe Peter should have just, shh, Peter, just chill. Be quiet. You don't understand it now. You'll understand it later. But like Peter is, he can't help but insert his foot into his mouth, even that dirty foot, and he has to speak out. It says, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So Peter, he foibles once again. Now he's telling his Lord how this should all come down. He's telling his Lord what he should do. Lord, you'll never wash my feet. That's not something that we should tell the Lord that we should never do something. I often say in marriage, there's two words that we shouldn't use. Never and always. It's weird how they come out. You never do this. I've done that like one time in 20 years. Are you serious? Or you always do that. So just be aware. Try to keep those out of your vocabulary in marriage. But here, Peter throws it out. Never Will you do this? Well, how did it actually work out for Peter? He got his feet washed. But then the backlash, the pendulum swings, and he's merely seeing this as a physical exercise. Remember that throughout John, he's trying to bring in spiritual application to what's going on in the lives of those who Jesus interacts with. Remember from John chapter 3, you must be born again. Nicodemus is like, what? I'm, I'm supposed to be born again out of my mom? No, Nicodemus. The woman at the well. Living water? Give me this water so I don't have to come back to this well. No, living water is something else. Something spiritual. You must eat my body and drink my blood. Remember, that wasn't literal. It was spiritual. So once again, Jesus is trying to lift up Peter in his mind in regards to a spiritual principle. But he just goes, no, wash me, wash all of me, wash my hands, wash my head. But Jesus responds, and he expounds on what he's trying to get across to them. John 13, 10 and 11, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, 
but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So can you see the inference to a spiritual cleansing there? Because he knows that not all of them are clean. Speaking of Judas. But in the practice in the Middle East, at this time, within the courtyard of your home, you would have a big water pot or cistern that you would go down into and you would bathe. You would get your big bath of the day. And then once you rose up out of that bath and dried off and got clothed, then you would just walk through the city and do your business. But when you came into a home, the slave there would wash your feet. Jesus is saying that same thing to us in a spiritual way. We kind of need to learn to read our Bible backwards. And we have to read it back to front to understand what he's saying. We have to know the Bible back and forth. He's saying that his blood would do the cleansing. His blood would be that that would pour over us and take away all our sin, past, present, and future. And our relationship with Jesus would be there and be constant. But as we trod through this world, we step in it. We make mistakes. We sin. We fall short of the glory of God. And what's the antidote? Washing of our feet. And we see that in 1 John 1, 9. You know the Christian slang, the Christian's bar of soap? That's what we get out to wash our feet with. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it continues our relationship with God. When we sin and we have unconfessed sin, our relationship with God, not in eternity, but just right on the surface, it's broken down. It isn't all that it should be. But when we confess our sins, then we can have that unity and oneness with the holy God. So know that the big cleansing has happened at the cross. But we constantly come to him to have our feet washed so that we stay in communion with him. So it talks about this many times in the epistles, that it's the washing of the water of the word that cleanses his church. It also tells us in Psalm 119, how does a man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the word. So we need to have short accounts with the Lord. We need to quickly come to him when we've fallen short, when we've stepped in it, and he will cleanse us and bring us back into an appropriate relationship with him. Well, let's move into verse 12. It says, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? And what's amazing here is that Judas isn't left to the side. Jesus washed all of their feet, even the one who is going to betray him. I don't know if you had foreknowledge of someone who was going to throw you under the bus, you would probably avoid that person. You'd probably stay away. You'd probably just get their pinky toe and that's it. But no, Jesus in a sense, bathed Judas's feet, but it was not enough. Judas was not one who called Jesus the Lord of his life. But Jesus washed his feet anyways, even though the betrayal was going to come. This idea of not knowing what I have done to you, I just think of the apostles hearing this question. Do you know what I have done to you? Yes, we totally get it. Uh, just because they're like us. And Jesus sometimes talked in mysterious ways. But Jesus brought more clarity to the situation in the next verse. It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Some translations say master and Lord. I kind of like that idea of master. Is he your master is he your teacher? Is he the greatest influence of your life? Do you get your education, your spiritual education from other sources? 
I mean, I believe we should be well-read and know what's going on in the world around us, be aware of what the cults have to say and how they oppose Jesus. But he should be the master, the main teacher in your life, and he should be Lord. But also see at the end of this verse, he once again lifts up an I am statement. It says, for so I am. He is God. God, the creator who just washed their feet. The example has been given. In verses 14 and 15, it says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So is he giving us the ordinance of foot washing? Have we been missing it at Oaks Bible Church because we don't have foot washing parties every six months? I don't know if you've ever been to a foot washing. Anybody here been to one before? They're kind of rough, aren't they? I mean, especially if they sneak one out on you. I remember the last one I heard about. It was actually about, ooh, man, 24 years ago. We were on a bus, and we got off after a long day of walking, and we got noise, got word that there was going to be a foot washing ceremony. And I remember that I slinked around the other side of the building so that I didn't have to uncover my feet and all that goes along with that to these people who just really wanted to serve me. But it was on my own conscience, you know, my own frailty in that way. But there's no ordinance for foot washing for the church to follow as an example. Really, there's two ordinances. And the way that we sort that out is one that we see it in the Gospels. We see something proposed, something done in the Gospels. We see it repeated in the book of Acts. And then it's expounded on in the epistles. So the only two ordinances that the church has are baptism, because we see that in the Gospels. We see it in the, books of Act, in the book of Acts, and it's expounded upon in the epistles. And also the Lord's Supper, what we do in regards of communion. So those are the two ordinances that the church are given today. So remember that he is talking about a spiritual practice here. And so it doesn't really translate in our world today. We've got sidewalks everywhere. And not, much, not many of us walk around in sandals getting dirt on our feet much. I know there's a lot of flip-flop people out there. And you get some dirty feet. But the church, in a sense, isn't called to wash feet. I think we could organize a night and do a foot washing and everyone would head out to oceans or to polish and get a pedicure before you came. And it really wouldn't be serving the purpose that foot washing is all about. Foot washing is supposed to be how we spiritually serve one another and give each other servanthood in humility. Humble servanthood to one another. And that translates different. For each one of you. There was a time in my ministry that moving people was washing feet. Helping them pack up their homes, seeing all their dust bunnies under their beds, under their mattresses, behind their amwas, hauling those things into a U-Haul, taking it across town and dropping it off in their new home. That was the way that I washed feet back in the day. I'll still do it today, but it's rough work. It's a lot harder in my 50s than it was in my 30s. But what are other ways that you can wash each other's feet? I think one of them's in the bulletin. You've seen five-plus names in the bulletin. You could wash their feet by praying for them. Maybe you could go the extra mile and call them and say, how can I specifically pray for you? Kind of the way I like to wash feet nowadays is to be at the door. And as you come in, sometimes you'll share with me what you stepped in, what's been going on, what's been hard. Sometimes it cracks you open and the water flows and there's cleansing that happens. 
But you just share your burdens. But please look for those opportunities to wash one another's feet. I want to kind of speak to the husbands in the room. What's the washing of the feet that needs to happen within your home? I mean, maybe if I pulled out a bowl of water and washed my wife's feet, it would go a long way. But maybe it would go much further if I actually washed the big old bowls in the sink that have been piling up for the last two days. But just to be aware of something you can do. And you parents, I know that you guys wash your children's feet all the time. They don't even understand it that you're washing their feet all the time. I want to thank you for that because that's what we need. We need godly parents washing their children's feet. That will keep this world from decay as you pass on spiritual cleansing into your children's life. But children in the room, I don't know. Is there something that could be done for your parents? Could you wash your parents' feet somehow? I don't want to give you any examples. I'll let you sort that out on your own. But humble foot washing is still for today. And I would just ask that you would pray and you would think about how you might serve others, not just within the body, but those out in the world. Well, let's move back into John chapter 13, 16, and 17. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. So we are not greater than our master. Jesus, he is our teacher and our Lord. We need to follow his example and do as he said, as he says. Don't separate you, separate yourself from doing what Jesus asked. We need to be his humble servants. But also notice what it says at the end of verse 17 it says blessed are you if you do these things i think a lot about church is about knowing things it doesn't say blessed are you if you know them blessed are you if you do them and church can be a lot about head knowledge and about knowing and somehow we feel secure in our intellectual understanding that I'm good, I'm blessed. I mean, we come to church for a blessing, and I definitely want my mind stimulated. The Lord uses the mind and the heart. But if it ends just with these two parts of our body and doesn't come out of our hands and our feet, then we're stymied. We're not as blessed as we could be. So it says, blessed are you if you do them. Don't just merely know these things, but do them. Well, we're going to move into our last couple verses. And this picture, beautiful picture of service is broken. It says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So here we see that Judas isn't brought out by name, but he knows that there's the traitor in the room. And often within a church service, you'll have three types of people. You'll have the committed, those who are committed to the Lord, that are saved, that are born again. You'll have the curious, those who are there just to see what's going on. I've heard rumors of this church or rumors of Jesus, rumors that the Bible is true. And they're curious and they want to know what's going on. They want to know, why are you so happy? In the midst of such difficult circumstances, why do you continue on and praise this God? You have the curious. And then, like Judas, you have the counterfeit. Somebody's in the room, but he has not submitted his life, his will, to the Lord. 
And my prayer is if there were to be a counterfeit here today, that as long as you have breath in your lungs, you can call upon the Lord to be saved and that you would do that very thing. Judas had already made a plan with the devil that he was going to betray our Lord. So his, his road was already cast before him. And we're going to hear more about him next week. But we also see that Judas is a fulfillment of prophecy. Right out of Psalm 41, verse 9. It says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That this person who shared intimate meals with Jesus was going to betray him. Judas went to the university of Jesus for four years, but he just didn't get it. He had another plan. He had another agenda. He wanted the overthrow of Rome. He was the CFO, the chief financial officer. He was looking for a lucrative position in regards of the world's riches. Oh, can't you see that this world is perishing? There's nothing here that's going to go with us into eternity. But what you do for one another, your humble service for one another, that gets loaded up in heaven aforetime. And you will receive that when you enter in. But Judas, he just couldn't get it. He didn't understand it. But it was a fulfillment of prophecy, and it authenticates who Jesus is. That's what prophecy does. He tells us, he told those of that time what would happen ahead of time so that prophecy would be fulfilled and the authentic, authentic, um, that w it would be authenticated of who Jesus was. And Jesus fulfilled every prophecy perfectly. And everything that the Word of God has prophesied to happen in the future will happen just like the Lord has said. So that's why it's great to read your Bible. Read the book of Revelation. See how it all turns out. Because God will fulfill, fulfill every jot and tittle. Every little mark within his word will come to pass. So as I wrap up tonight, I know the majority of you are the committed. You're at the table with Jesus. You love him. You're following him closely. Could there be some of the curious just in the room tonight? Well, I pray that your curiosity would be met with the truth of who Jesus is and that he will receive you. And he's desirous to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all sin. I also want you to know that Often we can be very secure that Jesus cleanses us from all of our sin. The things that we have perpetuated against the Lord, sinful behaviors of our own. But sometimes what sticks with us is the sins that, that have been per perpetuated against us. That when people have sinned against us, that somehow we're stained, we're blemished. That this horrible act occurred upon us. And you feel stained. You feel shamed by what happened to you. I would ask that you would release that. That Jesus' blood, the washing of the feet, it takes away those stains too. You are no longer impinged upon by the past, by the sins perpetrated against you. That those are gone. He remembers them no more. And don't let the devil continue to remind you of things you have done or the things that have happened to you. You are free of all those things. If there's a counterfeit in the room, Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow up together. At the end of the age, he'll send his angels and he'll decipher the wheat from the tares. So what we're called to do as saints is just wash the feet of whoever comes in here. Just love every single person and every person you interact with out in the world. Go out and wash feet. This is what we see in our very last verse. 
It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives he who sent me. A glimpse of the Great Commission that we're supposed to go out and make disciples. That as we go out and share the love of Jesus, some people will see it. They will see us as Christ's ambassadors, and they will validate who Jesus is, and Jesus validates the Father. But you are called to be soldiers in the Lord's army. That hasn't ended, and I think it's ramped up more than ever in the world that we live in. You are shining lights of hope in a dark world. So do. Do what he's asked you to do. And he will empower you to do it. He'll give you wisdom in each circumstance in life, how to wash feet. Be open to it. Be ready for it. And then respond to the leading of the Spirit. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this example. We know that we are merely created beings, but we are created beings that have been purchased by you. And not only have you purchased us, you keep us. You love us to the uttermost. You love us to the very end. I could see you looking at us and saying, well, I really got a lemon with that one. But no. You stick with us, and you make us better. You wash us, and you conform us into your image. I pray, Lord, that you would show us how to have in this world physical, humble service towards one another. But also, we would know how to give spiritual, humble service to one another. That we would know how to confess our sins one to another, and pray for one another and hold one another accountable and to bring a purging and a healing that way. We know that we have been washed by the blood of Jesus, that truly you are our Passover, that the angel of death has passed over us and you have marked us with your blood and we have eternal life. So please bless my brothers and sisters tonight Use your word to spur us on to love and good works. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.